Thank you so much for that. I'm Heather Gagliano. I'm a registered nurse with a master's of science in nursing. I'm the operations and education director with the Idaho Immunization Coalition. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us. My name is Karen Sharpnick. I'm with the Idaho Immunization Coalition and I'm the executive director. And by the way, we're going to flip back and forth because we're in a hotel room in Pennsylvania. So you just, we're going to have to just kind of play with this a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Jocelyn, for pulling up our slides. Um, we don't have any disclosures um, for this. Next slide. So today uh, we're going to be talking about a few different things. Um, <clears throat> I thought the title of the presentation of immunization compliance policies and misinformation in schools was a great one. So to go through that, we're going to hopefully learn about Idaho, the immunization rules in Idaho, talk about our rates in Idaho. We're going to talk about a little bit about um, misinformation and different reputable sources. We're also going to talk about some of the legislative updates that we have seen over this past legislation, legislative season, um, which is always an interesting topic to talk about. So next slide. So before we go on, let's talk about why vaccine rules are important. You know, if we have rules, they should be there for a reason. And why are they there? And it's just a great grounding reminder that vaccine rules are there really to help reduce that risk of vaccine preventable diseases in children. And when they're in schools, they are in close quarters, kids get sick, and transmission for these communicable diseases is a lot higher. So that really helps to have those rules in place to help prevent the transmission of these diseases and from kids getting sick. They also help the school's response. So in the case there, we do have an outbreak of a vaccine preventable disease, it helps the schools determine, you know, who they need to talk to, who's most at risk, if they're vaccinated, if they're not. So that's why those are important for those two different reasons. We do see vaccine preventable diseases in Idaho. You know, we talk about them, sometimes we think about them as not being around anymore, but they very much are still around. In 2023, we had 10 cases of measles, which we hadn't had measles in Idaho for many, many years. And they have come back, unfortunately, knock on wood, we haven't had any cases so far in 2024, um, but we did have quite a few in that 2023 time. We have seen so far this year 25 cases of pertussis, um, which also is a highly contagious respiratory disease that really can be impactful and detrimental for young children. Next slide. So what are the immunization rules? So uh, for most of the school nurses and administration, they already know those rules so well, but just again, as a ground setting for anyone who might not happen to remember what they are, there are rules put out in uh, Idaho code that state that children need to have certain vaccines prior to entry to school. And it depends on the student's age, the grade they're going into on what those are. Um, I wanna point out um, that the, recommend, the vaccines that are recommended by ACIP or that vaccine schedule that really helps protect children and anyone um, for those recommended vaccines aren't all on the recommend, aren't all required. So you'll notice that we don't have HPV is not on there, flu is not on there, COVID is not on there. These are just the ones that are put into rules stating that these are the ones that have to be put in. But as healthcare providers, we really should be recommending all vaccines to protect children against all vaccine preventable diseases. Um, and I want to point out also when you're looking at this, you know, at kindergarten to sixth grade, if a student is, you know, we report out school rates and uh, which students are vaccinated or not at, you know, kindergarten, first, seventh grade, twelfth grade. So there's those various grades where you're actually putting in a report. but just because you're not putting in a report in for that year, like fifth, fourth graders or fifth graders, they still need to adhere to those school rules of actually being up to date on those vaccines. So we've talked about what the rules, you know, what the rules are, why they're important. Let's hear from Karen, who can really talk about the policies and that uh, have gone in or sorry, the legislation that was talked about and discussed and the different rules that were potentially put in or looked at during this past legislative season. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. Well, as you can well imagine, uh, vaccines are a hot topic for Idaho, uh, as well as across the United States. So throughout the United States, there was over 400 vaccine-related bills. Speaking for Idaho last year, we did see 25, and this year we saw 14. As of today, we signed died, which means that the House and the Senate have said we're done. But that doesn't mean we're done with the session. I'm going to just do a bit of level setting. What happens now is the governor needs to sign the rest of the bills if he has not done it, or he has to veto them. If he vetoes the bills, the legislature has another five days. So he has five days to do that. Then they have another five days to come back that if they have, then they do have a super majority, they can come back and override his veto. So in a sense, we are done with the session. But you also, we don't know until everything's done. So again, we're all excited today because it has been a session. As you can see, and I know you can't see the details, but there were several bills that we look at as an organization. So we are the advocacy, as part of everything that we do do, part of what we do is advocacy. So we are the voice to bring in like-minded organizations, like-minded people to help us either stop the bills from moving forward monitor the bills, or actually pull bills in a positive way forward. And so there were a few that we really took an eye on and we really worked behind the scenes. One was the vaccine uh, for the assessment board. So um, every five years, there's a sunset for the vaccine for children program that needs to be looked at and okayed through the insurance. So this is the insurance department, even though it's vaccine related. So we worked very quietly behind the scenes with the assessment board and it did pass through. This is a huge deal because this means another five years we have this in place. The end goal is that we do not have to do a sunset every five years. This is just an automatic law and we move on. So that'll be our next like five years that we hope that will happen. We were hoping this year, but it, it didn't happen. The other bill that was very, very important to us was the the, the Iris bill, which is the, the, the um, ah, I'm sorry. Iris, I'm not, what does Iris mean? I'm sorry. So it's a registry bill, the vaccine registry bill. Sometimes people don't know what Iris is. So currently, and we have been since like 2010, your, when your baby is born, you're automatically in the vaccine registry. So if you choose to, as a parent, you can always opt out of the vaccine registry. We make it very easy. There was a legislator for whatever reason, this is the third time she's done it. She truly believes it needs to go back the other way where the parent has to put yourself into the registry. So it's an opt in bill. This was really going to be a very challenging bill on, on every level. So we actually fought it quite hard. Um, with that said, um, it did pass the house, but when it got into the Senate, it was held by actually that legislator. So this is a positive thing moving forward. A lot of education, a lot of talking to um, um, our legislators, a lot of parents were getting involved. We testified, we wrote letters, we made phone calls, we put op-eds. I mean, we really, there were like-minded organizations along with thousands of people. And believe it or not, it was thousands who came forward to say, this is not a good bill. The other bill that we were looking at was and there was good intent on the legislator side, but the how it was written, it didn't come across that way in the House, where it was, we are not going to mandate vaccines in schools anymore. And that was not her intent, but that's how it was written. So we assisted with having some additional rewriting and amending of what that might look like for the intent she had, because it went really fast in the House. It did pass the House, but when we got to the Senate, she held it at that time. It wasn't the intent to change that, but those are like the bills where we were actually looking at. Um, the other ones were either monitored, didn't get anywhere, or didn't get on people's pockets. The one that did pass through that we just kind of took a step back on was to say, if you're 18 years old, you have the ability to exempt out of vaccines. Well, that's already in code. This is already a law. For some reason, it was rewritten because sometimes you can rewrite bills with a couple of words to say it again. And so that bill actually did get passed through. I'm going to say it is what it is. So you'll see as when my next slide comes, there are times we monitor the bills going, well, that's not really going to make a difference in what we're doing. And then sometimes they're like, we're going full force like we did. And other times we're going to help move a bill forward. So this is something we do is 
as a coalition because we are a collective group of people who come together to have one voice. And so this is, we bring the group of people together to have one voice in the legislative session. And all the great work that we may be, everybody's doing in the vaccine area, you do have to have really good policies and rules and laws and bills in place. So you do need to have somebody who convenes this. And we've been lucky enough that this is part of our organization that we're able to help this way. Next slide, please. Okay, so I did mention the bill 397 which was the, the IRIS bill. And this is a few things that we did. This is why it's important. 90% of what we do behind the scenes, because I do have three lobbyists and I actually have a full-time marketing comms organization that works on this with us. So we are very quiet. We're actually called Get Immunized Idaho. So yes, we are the Idaho Immunization Coalition, but our advocacy group is called Get Immunized Idaho on purpose so that we're able to not draw attention to ourselves. So because we did reap our head out of like the water this time on this particular bill, so now we got to be seen and we haven't been seen in five years. Everything else we've done for the past five years, it's all been behind the scenes. It's all been very quiet. It's all been education. It's all been talking to legislators, but now we needed to actually be out there. So one of the things we did was we put a one pager together and the one pager gives the, the legislator an opportunity in less than five minutes to read about what this bill is. We give the facts. We talk about how much money it's going to cost. We talk about the, the, the outcome that it may have. And this happened to be a bill we were trying to stop. So when we were sharing with this bill, just from the, just from the state of Idaho immunization program, it could have been upwards of $750,000 to change over that bill. The other part is we found out it was going to be about $10 million across our state for providers to change what they needed to change over. Outside of all of the other issues that were going to be there, we also, bottom line is it usually is dollars and cents that makes the difference. So we were actually calling to attention that this was going to be a huge lift for our providers in our state. The other thing is you see, we do testify. We don't bring 100 people in. We bring in four or five. We are very strategic. We walk, we talk about talking points. We talk about messaging. We build a story together as we go in and have it. So we're not having everybody say the same thing, or we're also not having like we're missing opportunities of, oh my gosh, we had a hole. So together, it's part of my job to actually say, okay, this is the message we want to bring forward. This is the message we're going to want to bring forward to that particular legislator who may or may not be like on the fence that we're going to get a constituent in his or her area to come and speak. So now they're, they're hearing for their constituents. The on the right, again, I know you don't see this, but it was more vi visual so I can talk. We do a lot of calls to action. So letter writing. So we will do a call to action. We have about 3000 or so actually more um, stakeholders. We can send this out to and saying, hey, this is the bill. Here's the overview of what this bill is. We want you to contact your legislator. So we'll have three or four letters that you can pick from. You can read them over, or write your own letter, and then you push a button. And when you push that button, it gives all the legislators names and you sign your name. So we're making it as simple as possible. We also ask to make phone calls. We also ask if you know somebody, we will do the right people to have those right conversations. So as we're going on and saying, this is who we need to talk to, we will find the right people to go in and talk to those legislators. So again, I'm gonna go with this bill. There were seven senators we needed to have conversations with. We are, it already passed the House, we're into this, the Health and Welfare Senate. Two were for, two were against, we had three on the fence. We concentrated on those three. I mean, we concentrated. So they got hundreds of phone calls. They got thousands of letters. And then would they actually, they had breakfasts and lunches and they had meetings. They were, they were barraged by the amount of people coming and talking with them. And we just, not anybody, we actually, it was a strategic thought process. Who is going to make the most impact if this bill moves forward? We also, for this bill, this is being transparent, we got a hold of the governor's office. We wanted them to know what is the impact if this bill moves forward. We are not saying that the governor was going to veto it, but he actually came back to our organization and said, I want research on A, B, C, D, E, and I need it within the next four hours. Stopped my work, got everything he needed. So then he was educated on what if this bill gets passed? What does this look like for Idaho? How does this, you know, hurt children? How does this hurt families? How does this, what is the impact on, on providers? So 
when we actually go out and we actually advocate, this is how we advocate. And so, but, but I'm going to go back to, this is not what we want to do. We want to do things behind the scenes quietly so that we are not out and about all of the time. But with that said, now I'm going to challenge you all. So I'm like pulling this forward. We would love, and like uh, Dr. Noreen Wallach is part of our, our organization that I have reached out to when we've needed to say, hey, I need this amazing provider who actually has a voice, who actually can help us. If you would like to have a voice with us, please let Heather know because we can put you on a list. We can send you out, you know, periodic emails. We're not going to like sell them or do anything with them, letting you know what we're doing as an organization. But we will have school rules that are coming up. Daycare and school rules will have public hearings this summer. And then they have to, all rules have to be open every five years. The school rules are being opened up in this year and then January they're voted on. We have to get the vote to say, yes, they're staying where they're at and we want them in place because there's always a chance things can come out or, or the legislature could actually just wipe them out altogether. And like, there's no school rules. I'm not giving you worst case scenario, but we are really gonna be working on the fact that we want people to stand up and saying, yes, we need to keep this in place. So just as an FYI, if you would like to be involved in this, we actually can actually reach out to you and have you do as simple as writing a letter, or if you want to testify, or if you have an organization that you want to work with, or the superintendent or two online, hey, listen, I can work with you and your schools and your school nurses and, and your teachers to say, this is important to us. So next slide, please. I'm going to actually hand this over to Heather for this next step of things. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. So let's talk about where we are in Idaho when it comes to school immunization rates. So uh, as we talk about um, for school nurses, very familiar with the concept of herd or community immunity that so many people need to be immunized against a vaccine preventable disease to be able to prevent that from then spreading throughout the communities. Typically we're looking, you know, for each disease it depends, but like for MMR it's 95% need to be vaccinated to prevent the spread. Um, of or prevent the you know if the disease was introduced to prevent it from easily spreading within the community so these are uh idaho rates that are published they are available on you know you can see them on the cdc website or health and welfare has them available for different school years so you can see the 2011 2012 school year uh the different uh, vaccines and how many kindergartners were up to date for example for ones with diphtheria, uh, tetanus pertussis was 89%. And then in the 2022-2023 school year went down to 81%. Um, same thing, MMR, we want that 95% of them, of children to be immunized and up to date because that helps reduce that potential spread of disease. It is in 2011 school year, 89.2%, 2022, 2023, 81.3%. I actually just recently, um, the other day, received an email from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare with some actually some preliminary numbers on this. So for the 2023-2024 school year. So for that, our MMR numbers went down below 80% of children being complete to 79.6%. For those complete on polio, 80.1% um, were complete. So you can see they're going down. So let's talk about the other graph below where it's kindergarten exemptions. So you can see the medical exemptions for the different school years are remaining pretty similar and the same. Um, in 2024, so this 2023-2024 school year, it was 0.2%. So not very much of a change. But let's talk about those non-medical. So in those 2011, 2012 years, 5.1%. Last school year it was 11.15%. Uh, we jumped pretty much two points this past to 13.9% on just non-medical exemptions. So in these preliminary numbers for all of those exemptions, it's 14.3% of our kindergartners in Idaho are not protected against vaccine preventable diseases. So uh, kind of big numbers there to digest. Let's talk a little bit about some reasons why that could be because again, medical reasons are staying pretty, pretty much the same. So it's the non-medical reasons. Um, next slide. 
So in Idaho, people can exempt for a variety of reasons, you know, medical, religious, philosophical. Um, so if we're looking at the philosophical um, and misinformation that might be there, I wanted to highlight here, there was a study that, uh, a report that came out of the Center for Countering Di uh, Digital Hate. It's a US-UK nonprofit. And it did a report that over half, so 60% of, 67% of misinformation that's out in social media is actually just being created and by 12 people. So these 12 people create it. So it's not necessarily truly shared by 12 people, but they're, they create it and then it disseminates out. And so they were able to track, you know, just anyone, you know, your neighbor or, um, you know, the grocery store owner, you know, people just average day, everyday people who were reposting this, they were able to track the originators of those to just 12 people. So again, you know, even though, um, we have people who have these uh, misinformation. It's not the majority who are producing it. It's actually just a few people, but it's uh, individuals see that. They sounds like it's real. Something could be there. And then they re, um, they reshare, repost, like, things like that. So as, as nurses, as medical providers, as educators, it's important for us to actually, when we're participating in social media and while we're sharing information, we want to make sure that we're sharing very factual, scientific, um, evidence-based information. And that can be difficult. Next slide. So let's talk about how do you spot fake information. Um, this is a really cool graphic from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, I have a link to this resource um, at the end with, you know, in my sources that you can pull up and it doesn't look exactly like this one, um, but it talks about how to really spot that fake information. So as nurses, if we see anything on social media, if we hear something, again, we wanna be able to consider the source, you know, who did it come from? We wanna actually, if it's a headline, because news organizations, as great as they are, as reporting things, they're there to catch us so we can read them. So we actually need to read beyond the headline and actually see what's within there. You want to be able to actually check to see who the author is and if they're credible. You want to see, it says consider the source, but it's really considering the sources. Do they cite their sources? Check the date. Is it new? Is it an old article? Is it something um, that came out recently? Sometimes things are jokes and gets reposted and people then glom onto it thinking it's real. There was a whole um, joke that was talking about how birds aren't real. And the, there was a joke along that, you know, birds are really um, spies, uh, they're um, machines, they're not really real. And, and it started off as a joke, but oddly enough, there were some people who took that joke as reality. So it's important for us to look at that. As crazy as that might seem, but people really started to believe that. Um, with these, you know, you want to make sure we're going beyond just those headlines, but actually reading medical journals, reading articles. There's some great information on the School Nurses Association website that actually provides really good information, factual information about immunization. So if you're ever wanting to share this about, you know, gosh, where are you hearing information from, from parents, from other uh, people that your coworkers, again, that International Federation of Library Associations actually has a really good graphic that you can share to help them understand how to go beyond that headline. I had a friend who actually shared in the middle of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, a, a headline that just, it seemed, sounded like they were quoting a um, peer review journal, sounded like it was, you know, from a physician. It just, it seemed really real. And I was able to take time through that, looking at, okay, who's the one who, who's the author, you know, was it really a journal article and, and actually dissecting it down, you know, the person who wrote the article didn't believe AIDS existed. And so when you talk about is the author credible or not, you know, if they don't believe that a disease exists, that's kind of leads some questions into that. They also continue to claim that they were a physician, but their actual license had been stripped from them when they were over, um, in UK. So it's just really good information that you're looking for um, to go beyond there to get that and find out if it's a good information. Next slide. So how do you talk to people? So if it, so you're you're there letting people know what the school rules are. You're advocating as healthcare providers, as members of the community that vaccines protect children. How do we want to address misinformation? So um, there is a pamphlet that is created by Frame.
works that really talks to people about how you address misinformation. Um, and I think that that's on the next slide, but this is a really good step in how you talk about it. So you wanna talk about what the facts are first. You wanna say, hey, you know, sometimes people think there's a little bit of misinformation here. They might think this. You, it, you know, explain um, why the facts might have been misinterpreted or if someone intentionally, you know, misinterpreted that information and then again, follow it with correct information. So you want to sandwich the factual information, warn them that they're going to hear some incorrect information and then what that incorrect information is um, along with what that factual information is. And it's important to actually sandwich it because somehow our human brains, even though we might hear that something's misinformation, we tend to then go, oh, I remember that was the last thing I heard that maybe there's some credibility to it. So this is a way that's been shown to really help address that misinformation. There's another toolkit um, that I put a little picture of. It's out of the Office of Surgeon General that talks about a community toolkit for addressing health misinformation. It's on the resource page. I highly recommend clicking it, printing it out, and really looking at the process of how those that misinformation is being utilized, how you can address that misinformation um, and utilize that and test it out and see what seems natural and works best for you. Next slide. So this is the frameworks I was talking about. It's really reframing how we discuss and talk about vaccines. Um, and this is a evidence-based. It's really kind of a really great guide. Again, recommend reading through it. It's 40 pages, which seems long, but I went through it very quickly and it's chock full of amazing information about how we discuss and talk about vaccines, how we can just um, reframe that discussion can really impact people's uptake and understanding. So for many years, we talked about immunizations, you know, being there to defend ourselves, defend our body, you know, it, it fights disease. And we found, and through this, um, uh, this pamphlet, they talked about through research, they found that that actually wasn't really sitting well with uh, people that they actually preferred the idea of the analogy that the vaccine was like a trainer and it was working in conjunction with the body to help your body prepare to fight off diseases. So it's your body is the one who's doing the work, the vaccine's just there to help coach it, you know, help um, prepare it. But again, it's the body that's actually doing that. So highly recommend this as an amazing resource for anyone, um, It, you know, Anyone going on vacation, getting ready for summer, it's coming up, a few more days, <laughs> a few more months or a few more weeks. Um, you know, if you're going anywhere, this is a great one to read. Next slide. So we talk about, you know, misinformation. Let's talk about factual information. So again, when you're looking at factual information, you still want to make sure that you're, you know, checking all of those resources. But if it's a new factual place for you to make sure it is factual, but once you've confirmed it, you know, Centers, Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention, um, they're a great resource. Immunize.org, if you're not familiar, has amazing resources for not only um, the public, but also for healthcare providers on how to talk about vaccines, information about them and the diseases they prevent. American Academy of Family Physicians has a really great patient care prevention wellness. Um, the, how to talk about immunizations with families. Um, Voices for Vaccines has this really cool thing called the Vaccine Quest. So if you yourself don't feel very familiar with vaccines, you might feel like maybe, yeah, I know I'm supposed to talk about them. And gosh, I remember talking about them in school. Um, but if you wanna go a little bit further and learn about vaccine development, how safety is, uh, regulated, um, all of that, there's this thing called the Vaccine Quest that is a self-paced module that you can go to. And I like the idea of it's a quest going through and learning about them, but I've gone through it myself, very educational and helps provide some really great information. At the same time, I also want to talk about great factual information from the Idaho Immunization Coalition. We have our uh, immunization summit coming up on December 10th um, in the Treasure Valley area. So if you want to learn more about that, you know, um, I, I don't know if Kim, you can drop my email in the chat or I could do that later. Um, you're welcome to email, get on our mailing list and we'll let you know about when that's coming up. But we're going to have some really great speakers, um, very uh, 
factual information, some really great information about immunizations, um, great connections with others, um, along with, as Karen was talking about, um, learning how to advocate and have your voice be heard when it comes to the importance of immunizations. Next slide. So that's some great resources for you that also has information for families. Let's talk about for some students and families. Uh, one of the things that you might find um, is there's an, a resource called Docket where it's just an, it's an app. I mean, they have an app for everything. Um, and it actually gives people access to their immunizations and their children's immunization records. And it comes through if they're in Iris and a couple of other states, they'll actually go ahead and pull it in and a parent can get that um, on their app. So it's great for school nurses if you're looking and you have a parent who forgot to contact their provider or, um, you know, it's for some reason uh, you aren't able to look them up in um, on the computer. They can actually pull up Docket, have their information, their immunization information, and then email out or print it if they need to. And then it also gives you reminders on, um, it'll tell you, hey, a vaccine is due for their child. It's a really cool resource. So they can scan it and get Docket from there. Um, vaccines, uh, Vaccines for Children program is a great program for people to actually get vaccines where the vaccines are no cost for the families. There is an administration fee and we have providers um, throughout Idaho who are part of that Vaccines for Children program so that when you do have children who do need to get vaccinated and um, cost is an issue, whether they don't have insurance, if they're on Medicaid and other reasons, they can go ahead and get that. If you're wanting to set up a vaccine clinic or you need to connect your families to vaccine resources, reach out to your local health department. They're going to be the best organization to know what, who in the area is providing maybe offsite, um, you know, if they're doing like a back to school clinic or end of year clinic um, that parents can easily access. Or if for some reason your health department doesn't know, reach out to the Idaho Immunization Program. They're the ones who actually oversee that Vaccines for Children program. I've put their general phone number and email on there and you can reach out to them. If your parent, if the parents are needing to get vaccines, they can go to vaccines.gov and it'll actually help them see where to go get flu shots, um, flu vaccinations, and it connects them with the bridge program, which will provide access to free COVID-19 vaccines for those who don't have insurance. The Idaho immunization program also is for, um, oversees 317 programs for vaccines for adults who don't have insurance. They might have some ideas if you have a parent who's needing to get vaccinated in the area on who to call and reach out to who might have access if the health department doesn't know. Next slide. So you can see all these different sources, but I have some um, great links for you to click and be able to utilize um, to get those toolkits. Highly encourage you to print them out or read them. They're amazing resources just as nurses, administrators, to be able to learn about immunizations, learn how to talk about them with families. Um, and with that, I appreciate you guys uh, taking your time and listening. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Karen. Um, that was really great. We do have a few minutes for questions, so uh, I'll just, if you do have a question, please use the, actually, let me just, feel free to unmute. So I just give you the ability to unmute. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to unmute, ask, or you can type this in the chat if you can. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, this is Tasha. Do you know, um, with just advocacy in the future, I know recently there was a new push in the code to make sure that school nurses or, or school districts were very upfront with parents about the fact that we had exemptions available for them to fill out versus before the parents you'd usually have to ask, um, you know, they didn't want to be um, if they didn't want to be vaccinated, then they would come to the school district or come to the nurse and say, I, I didn't want to, but now we're putting them on our forms. And I'm wondering yeah. if that's increasing, you know, obviously the exemptions, because I'm finding too, it's not even a matter of they actually opposing the vaccines. It's a matter of just convenience. Like, I don't even want to get my kid vaccine. I'm vaccinated. I'm behind. I'm not going to worry yeah. about the additional ones that we need to do. I'll just sign this form and be done with it. And I feel like my hands are tied in that situation. 
parents should be educated on what their choices are. And so the, the information that you're talking about, it is a requirement that we let parents or the, the school districts let parents know, hey, listen, you know what, here, either you get your vaccines up to date or you're actually able to exempt out. So this was something, especially in the last five years that parents didn't know they were able to exempt out. Yes, we have high exemption numbers. Is that a correlation? It could be. It also could be that because of the pandemic and because of what was happening with COVID and all of the other misinformation as well as information that was out there, that parents got a little bit concerned and may not have all of the information that they need to, to be able to make decisions if they are not able to have conversations with providers or school nurses or whoever it is. So um, yes, it is. It, we do want everybody to know that they have a choice. Is there a correlation? M my sense is there is. You have to know we have been the highest in the country as far as exemption rates for years. So in the 11 years I've been in this job, I think we were number two a couple of years in a row, but we're, we're number one. Um, and it's unfortunate, but this is where we're at. Um, also, just know as administrators and if you're school nurses, they're, they're welcome to fill out the, the exemption form that is online that you can get in the Department of Health and Welfare. Or, but they also can do it just on a piece of paper. And they can, the parent can actually just, you know, name of child, what they want to exempt out, a signature and the date. I mean, it could be that simple also. So the, the rules are quite easy for a parent to be able to have those conversations and to exempt out. Um, and Heather wanted to add on something, so I might be forgetting something. So could you hold on a second? And then we can check to see if we've answered your question. So, um, Tasha, you talked about how parents are saying that's kind of the easier choice, like, OK, they've gotten vaccines, um, from what I understand. But, you know, they don't want to take off. They don't have the ability to take off time or they might not be able to get into the doctor's office. That's why it's important to reach out to those vaccine providers to try and coordinate maybe a clinic on site and as a school administrators, welcoming and opening it up so that for people who do choose to vaccinate, who do want to be able to get their kids up to date, they have that option to do it in the safe space, you know, having a school nurse available, having a vaccine provider come in and be able to offer those vaccines. Um, I can't, you know, guarantee if that, you know, if you're able to find that, but that's a, a good option to allow that and open it up so that students have that, they're already there, get them taken care of so that the, for the parents who did, you know, decide that that's why they wanted to do it, say, hey, we've got, we're gonna work on actually being able to help support you and not only protecting your kid, but also getting, you know, getting them up to date and not and reducing that barrier of them having to take time off or trying to find a provider. So, you know, um, I remember seeing that when I was doing school nursing and it's like, oh, I don't have time. It's like, well, let's help remove that excuse. So. I have a question. Elizabeth Conrad. Am I on? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yep, we can hear you. Uh, I'm a school nurse in a private school. We have three-year-old preschool, four-year-old pre-K, plus kindergarten through six. Am I incorrect in having my four-year-old pre-kindergartens get their immunizations at four? Noreen, do you want to, your hands up, do you want to talk so it's not just me? <laughs> Yeah, heavens no. Yeah, you can get your kindergarten immunizations at four years of age. There, There is, you know, there have to be, as you know, intervals between, in particular, well, all of them have um, intervals um, that you have to be aware of. But yeah, if, if they're, um, if it's appropriate for them to receive their kindergarten vaccines uh, after four years of age, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, that's they, they share the same building as the rest of the students. Yes, and, and you know, I had my hand up to say that, you know, I, I've, I've always long held that school nurses are our secret weapon to be pro-vaccine. Of course, as pediatricians, that's our job as well. But even the way you guys as school nurses word, um, when, you, when you communicate with families about, oh, it's time for your child's immunizations, it, even the way you, you phrase it can 100% make a difference between a family who 
like I'm going to sign this, you know, I'm going to get a scrap piece of paper because I'm busy and I'm just going to say I don't want my child to be immunized versus like, oh, okay, I'll get that immunization. I see um, Hillary Rahill on this call who I know has organized some of these um, uh, vaccine clinics that you were talking about, Heather. So, you know, you you have power in your position and, and families, believe it or not, do actually listen to you. So So never forget that. Thank you. Um, we, we're, gonna, that, we're going to transition into our case now. So I'm going to pull that up. Um, Tasha, can you um, feel free to introduce yourself um, as I pull up that case form and to go ahead and to start? All right. Thank you. Again, my name is Tasha Hussman. I'm a nurse in the Boise School District. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present. I have to say <laughs> my case significantly improved, which is wonderful um, in the couple of months since I signed up for this case. But I think it's worth mentioning um, because it does highlight um, the power of the school nurse and also the team, the education team in improving outcomes um, for kids. And I still do um, seek some recommendations on this case. So I will just get it going. So um, my kiddo uh, is a third grader male um, at this school and he um, has a history of G-tube feedings um, since early childhood uh, for supplemental, supplemental nutrition. And, and only recently was also diagnosed with ADHD um, in the setting of poor uh, educational performance and also struggles with nutritional status, uh, poor nutritional status. His background, he was uh, diagnosed as a failure to thrive as an infant. He was preterm. He is the only child and I don't know the exact age, but as a very young child, he um, was hooked up with a Mickey G-tube and received significant feedings um, at, at least four times a day um, and the volume increasing as he was able to tolerate. He worked with a gastroenterologist and was continually under 5% for weight um, through early childhood, preschool, and even um, into elementary school. His parents, um, were very obviously very concerned and um, one time actually doubled up on his feeding, I guess uh, on a, the feeding pump maybe accidentally and he was able to tolerate it and they weren't seeing very much success. So they ended up continuing that under the recommendation of their gastroenterologist to do larger feedings and at more frequent intervals. So he was getting feedings almost every three hours while he was awake. Um, and then they started to notice some significant um, weight gain Additionally, um, it wasn't until second grade that he was noticing, uh, they were really trying to latch on to this idea that um, at least the, the, the teachers were noticing that, you know, in the setting of his poor academic performance, he probably had some signs of ADHD and a Vanderbilt was given to him uh, for his teacher and parents to fill out. And then he was, he met with a pediatrician um, and was diagnosed with ADHD and started on the medicine um, because they were worried about appetite um, with other stimulants because the student in light of the four feedings that he got a day would not eat very much uh, food by mouth even though um, it was offered to him um, he brought snacks to school um, but wasn't eating a lot so the difficulty was in at school because he was receiving actually three feedings at school in second grade this is before i got here it was taking a um, significant amount of his time away from the classroom. Um, setting up the pump and then running for the 45 minutes, sometimes there are problems with the pump. Um, it would beep or it would leak. And so he was constantly coming to the nurse office or the nurse was constantly going to the office or to the classroom to help him. Um, and so that nurse really worked with the parents um, and the education team to move at least the feedings from three feeds to two feeds a day um, and tracking weight consistently and also what he was eating at lunch. Um, and that was somewhat successful, but then the child started losing weight again, um, according to the parents. So when he showed up in third grade, um, which is this year, um, we were down to two feedings a day, uh, once in the morning, right when he got to school, uh, and then once 
we'd, we'd hook him up before he got on the school bus. And so plans were arranged to, to make sure that that was safe for him and it would run through um, the, the bus that he, where he was on and then we'd receive, he'd be home with his family. And, and my, when I received this child in third grade, I was concerned because there, a lot of autonomy was not learned at, still at this point. He had a little bit of autonomy in setting up or understanding his pump. Um, but if there were problems or um, it was beeping or something, he, you know, we'd come to the school, he would come to me. Um, but also these large volume feedings also caused a lot of urgency to use the bathroom. And sometimes he would have accidents. Actually, frequently he would have accidents. Um, and so we were spending a lot of time helping him and there was some increasing autonomy in taking care of that. But in years past, he had, you know, as an only child and also just kind of having a lot of people do things for him, he was not actively participating in that. And so when October conference came, the education team got together and said, you know, he is significantly behind because um, he doesn't spend hardly any time in the, in the classroom at all um, because he's always at the nurse office. And I think finally, um, with I was there at the, at the October conference, and finally with that input from the teachers who really cared about him, you know, he also was going to pull out uh, special education too, and he was missing a lot of that time too because that was right when the feeding was going to be finished in the morning. Um, the parents kind of took that to heart, and we um, ended up switching him to one feed in the fall, so he was only getting one at the end of the day on his way home. Um, and that helped significantly with his time in class. Also, he got a, I think it was like a timer or something. So he, if he needed to use the restroom, the nurse's bathroom, he could only spend five minutes doing that, like get there, do his thing, and then come home, come back to class because he was kind of um, getting distracted, spending, taking a lot of time to do other things. Um, and also, you know, within the setting of ADHD, that's probably difficult for him. So, even though with the reduced feed, um, the concern was is how much food was he getting during the day um, and how much calories and nutrition was he getting during the day because he still wasn't eating very much lunch um, and he did have snacks and his parents were sending him with high calorie snacks, but these high calorie snacks weren't the most healthy snacks. So they're like chips and sometimes candy bars, sometimes, um, I mean, Nutella, things like that. Um, and so he would eat a lot of that in the morning sometimes, sometimes he wouldn't, and then he would not really eat his lunch, which had more of a balance, uh, balanced uh, nutrition. So this is kind of just what we've been working with him through him constantly through the year, eating good food, you know, making sure his to feed was he was getting that and communicating with parents, trying to be very honest with parents um, because they were very, very worried about his weight and didn't want to go back um, fall back, but also he was still not performing very well in the classroom. Uh, again, was on guampacine for some behavior, for, for some uh, focus management, but it wasn't quite helping him. And then in January, all of a sudden, the parents decided that they were done with feeds and actually he got his G-tube removed. Um, and it was quite sudden. I didn't get really much of a heads up about it. And um, I can talk to them a little bit about some options for medication uh, for ADHD that might be more beneficial like Stratera or something like that that wouldn't cause appetite suppression. But um, the student actually went on Concerta. Um, I put in my notes that it was Stratera, but it actually was Concerta. I saw them saw the medication. So he's been on Concerta 18 milligrams um, this whole time. And he does not have a G-tube. And we are we are here. <laughs> so I have to say um, over the course of the last couple of years, his percentage of body weight um, has improved significantly. So he's now, I believe he is maybe 25%. So that's a huge jump from 5%. So he's doing well that way. And I think this gastro was, was a part of that, making that decision. But where I am now is that now I don't see him very much, obviously, because he's not. I'm not managing that G tube, but parents. I was at an IEP meeting, and parents want to make sure that he's getting eating high, you know, eating really well on his meal, and even suggesting that we enforce that he eats his main part of his lunch, you know, before he goes out to play. But we really don't have those kind of resources or 
want to give that pressure to anyone to do that. Although, you know, we've tried just encouraging and things like that. And then also, you know, he is on this Concerta, this ADHD medication that might suppress his appetite um, a little bit. He's on 18 milligrams, which isn't a lot, but he still is quite, you know, a small child. And so I'm wondering, you know, what is the nursing role here? Are there, what, you know, there's a delicate balance of talking with the parents. I think I might have been a little bit too forward when talking about his snacks that he gets during the day because they want him to have access to snacks that's on his IEP all the time, but they're always really unhealthy snacks. I mean, I've seen a protein dark bar maybe once, but it's like Twix and chips, um, you know, and he'll eat fruit, but that's not high calorie, you know, and that causes some GI issues for him. So I, I don't want to give offense, but I also want to be very direct with the parents. Um, and sometimes and they've been a little bit hesitant talking to me as I'm a late about his, his medication. So I think that's the main gist of it. And I would say also say that parents have decided to come to school to eat lunch with him occasionally. And I don't think that's a long-term solution and not to help his autonomy, you know, and he's a third grader. It's not going to be the best for social um, learning as well. So that's where I'm at. And I can ask, answer any questions. Looks like, looks like Tracy has a question. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha, for bringing this forward. Really appreciate it. And really just want to give you kudos for getting involved um, and taking on the school role, school nurse role like you are. Just a, a question, what type of conversations have you been having with the prescribing providers and the gastroenterologists about what was happening? Yeah, that's a great question. Pretty limited. It's only just the, um, the, the progress notes back and forth and they lost, and then the parents have not been clear with me about which pres uh, which provider that they're actually working with, because they lost their provider for a while. So I suggested some new ones, and now I don't have. I'm kind of in this lapse of communication where they received a new provider, but they um, ha haven't followed up with me on who that person is. So I don't know who the new provider is that's prescribing the Concerta, and that is on my next step is to talk with, find that out. But again, the communication with the family seems to be very disjointed, so it's difficult for me to track. Okay, good for you. Yeah, I would try to get that authorization for exchange of info. Um, <clears throat> when you do find out the, who the provider is to have those conversations so you can share what you're seeing. And then yeah. just the other that you started to touch on was, um, you know, a huge part of eating for kids is the socialization and, um, you know, we for, and, and you didn't, but like when kids are getting G2 feedings, they lose out on that social development of not being with peers during eating and kind of like the breaking bread with friends and teachers and, and kind of sharing in that social aspect. So we, we almost, when we do get to trying to build up nutrition with G tubes, we kind of separate kids. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm glad to hear that he's back in the cafeteria and eating and, and parents, although like I agree with you at short term or segueing that um, process with them, but um, there is a huge component with socialization and eating um, that's very helpful. So I'm really glad you guys are having him back in the cafeteria and back with his peers and, and maybe that'll help too. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Thank we only you. have a couple minutes left. So if we could start with Kelsey and then end with Maureen. <laughs> great. Hi, so I'm a dietitian. Um, and can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, well, first of all, yeah, I would say for like, I think the socialization when you're eating is also, you know, great, but let's say he had to go back on tube feeding because he starts to lose weight or something happens. One strategy that we use sometimes is feeding overnight. And so at home, um, and so then during the day, I was thinking that would benefit him for staying in class and, and still eating with his peers but the majority of the food is through the night. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that sometimes. Um, but also 
possibly creating a list of high calorie foods that is slightly healthier. The parents, you know, just printing off a list that they could have, you know, things that really jump out to me would be like granola, um, protein bars, like you said, protein drinks, even because that might be, you know, easier to drink and digest. Um, and just coming up with a list of like, these are some really high calorie, healthy food options that um, we would encourage, you know, while he's at school. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, yeah hopefully, I'm I'm hoping he won't have to get his G two back in and maintain his weight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think we're on an upward trajectory. It's just been a slow process for sure. Thank yeah. you. And that's his whole life. He's always been on G two phase. He's always lost kind of his idea of what it feels like to be hungry. So. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any comments or? ideas go ahead noreen yeah yeah so um tasha you're just the most recent example of how um school nurses and school staff really just go above and beyond for the students um i think you and the school staff should get some kudos uh like tracy did that you know that you you care this much about this kid and his his success not just academically but in life i do have three recommendations super quick um, one is exactly what Kelsey said. These handouts um, that go over, that give you a list of high calorie, not super high cost foods exist. And Kelsey ha probably has some, I definitely have some. Um, I think it's super important um, that you maintain um, good communication with the family. Cause one of the things that I find school nurses are, are really good at is developing that rapport with the family that even us physicians don't get because you have just that more, you know, day-to-day one-on-one with the student. So maybe scheduling a phone call once a month or every other um, week where you, you can even suggest maybe I'll weigh him and we'll, we can compare scales just to keep your, your lines of communication open with the parents. So yeah. if something does come up, like a medication change, you are one of the people they they think of telling. Mm -hmm. um, and then just gently remind them that, He's on concerted 18, and if he's small, that will 100% decrease his appetite for lunch. It just is going to. It, it doesn't even matter what your medical history is. He's not going to eat great lunch. He still should socialize with his friends. They should still offer snacks. But he probably won't be hungry until after school or before dinner, and then definitely after dinner. And so maybe mm -hmm. once you develop more rapport with them, just reminding them that, you know, wanting him to eat some, you know, 90% or more of his lunch every day is just not going to happen. It's unrealistic. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's all I have at the time. 